Hello everyone, and welcome to the very first online stock slam. My name is Damon Cannon, and I'm your host for this evening. I've been a private investor for just over 15 years, although with rather more dedication in the last decade as my portfolio has grown. During this time, I've had the good fortune to meet and become friends with many other private investors. This has been enormously enriching, but it wasn't easy to achieve with a full-time career and growing family commitments. It's no wonder that investing can feel like a rather lonely hobby at times, when it can be so much more than that. Which brings me on to today's event. For everyone who has never attended a stock slam before, which will be most of you, the idea is very simple. It is primarily a social event where private investors can come together and share ideas. Obviously, the social aspect doesn't work so well online, but we have set up a Discord channel where anyone can post during and after the event. A link is shown in the chat window, and please feel free to join the conversation. We won't be actively monitoring the channel, so please don't post questions for the presenters in Discord, but otherwise, it's free for you to use. Now, to get the conversation started, we have 10 investors who have agreed to present a company of their choice to the audience. Each presenter is allowed three minutes to pitch their idea, which is rather shorter than it sounds. And at the end of each piece, we allow a few minutes for questions before moving smartly onto the next presentation. In this way, we get to hear about a number of investment ideas and nobody doubt stays there welcome. Now, as some of you will know, I've been running real world stock slams in London since 2018. And the inspiration for starting these events came out of a conversation that I had with Ed Croft, the founder of Stockopedia, about three years ago. At the time, we talked about how hard it was for private investors to meet each other and share their ideas. Things have improved on this front, particularly in the last year, but it's always been difficult to meet other people who share a passion for investing. So with Ed's support, we hosted a number of successful and entertaining stock slams for a growing audience. The only problem was that, well at best, only a hundred or so people could attend any event due to the need to be physically present in London. I always dreamt that perhaps one day investors anywhere could hold their own stock slams to meet other local investors. There's certainly nothing special about holding them in London and I hope to see regional events taking place. However, with this pandemic, the world has changed and we're all used to joining large online events. So it turns out that the stock slam is going nationwide after all, just not the way I expected. Even better, PI World are recording the event and a video of the whole thing will be available in a few days, which means that even more people will get to enjoy the experience. So don't worry about trying to frantically write down everything that you see in here. Instead, sit back with a beverage of your choice and enjoy the show. What will happen next is that I'll start the show with our first presentation. And when my time is up, Tamsin from PI World will manage questions from the audience and I'll do my best to answer them. Don't be shy. And when we've exhausted the supply of questions, or one at a time, I'll introduce the next presenter and we'll do the whole thing again. Some of the investors putting themselves in the firing line will be familiar to you, but many won't be. That's the beauty of the stock slam. Anyone can put themselves forward to talk about their best investing idea, and next time, it could be you. So, without further ado, I will start my presentation. So, my pick this evening is Caledonia Mining. I'll say straight off, this is a gold mining company based in Zimbabwe and operating a single mine only. I mean, any one of these points is a bit of a flashing warning sign for most people and put them together and you've got investment kryptonite. So let's be clear, this is not a share for widows and orphans. For a decade until 2019, the share price, as you can see, went nowhere as the mine struggled before quadrupling in the space of a year as the gold price skyrocketed. In other words, it's a volatile share. Then from its peak last summer, Caledonia's share price has been dragged down a good 40% by the deflating gold price. However, that's the bad news. The good news is that Caledonia is more than just a proxy for holding gold directly. The fall in the share price rather assumes that Caledonia is set to keep producing the same amount of gold year in, year out. And up until now, that would have been a fair assumption, because in each of the last three years, the company consistently produced around 55,000 ounce, 55, ounces of gold per year. I mean, that record in itself is pretty good, but management weren't idle. Instead, they pushed forward a six-year investment program to build essentially a brand new mine under the existing one. I mean, it turns out that the blanket mine ore body continues far deeper than the current mine, and access to this additional ore is set to transform Caledonia. At the moment, mining is possible down to 750 meters through an archaic network of tunnels, but the new central shaft that's been built plunges directly down to 1,200 meters. This modern shaft will hugely improve the efficiency of operations while opening up the brand new untapped ore body. 
As a result, total production should jump from 58,000 ounces last year to 61 to 67,000 ounces in 2021 before heading up to 80,000 ounces in 2022. This is a 40% jump in production in two years, and I suspect that management are being cautious with their numbers. In the past, they've continually raised production targets as a result of operational improvements, and it is clear that the mine is about to become a lot more efficient, which will directly reduce the cost of production, improve profit margins, and make the mine even more competitive. Still, it's clear that analyst forecasts already include much of the gains, with profits forecast to jump 81% in 2021. But, as you'll see, this puts the PE ratio at less than five, which is simply too cheap for a profitable, high-quality, cash-generating gold miner with no exploration risk. I mean, this is right at the bottom end of the sector, and potentially the ratio could recover to maybe seven and a half if sentiment improves. At the same time, the board are committed to returning money to shareholders, primarily to a rising dividend. It's already gone up three times in the last year, and they are tactically exploring prospects elsewhere in Zimbabwe. But these aren't greenfield sites either but proven mines that have been mothballed for decades. If management can turn just one of these other mines around, just like Blanket, then the current share price will look like a bargain. And that's it. Thank you. I now take questions. Thank you very much. Um, we have one question that asks, are plans to buy prospective land from government good use of capital or reverse on promise to return capital to investors? Well... The capital they're putting forward up front isn't huge, but obviously there will be costs to bring these brownfield sites back up to production if they choose to do so. But historically, and continuing now, Caledonia have essentially been very cash generative. So they they had a, a long six-year period of CapEx investment to build this new shaft. And now CapEx is falling, production is going up, and they say they've, they, they've got enough cash flow to both pay increasing dividends to shareholders and engage in these brownfield sites. So I, I, don't, I think they're keeping both sides happy here. And to follow on from that, someone saying it's been cash flow negative for 2018 and 2019. How are you sure that it's positive this year? Has there been a placing? Uh, uh, as far as I can see, there's been no placing. The Share history is slightly more complicated by the fact that a number of years ago, the Zimbabwe authorities required mines and operations to be uh, predominantly owned by uh, essentially local people or the government. And so there were different shareholder groups that were on the share register. And that meant that the, this company, Caledonia, only owned, I think, half of the mine. But over the intervening years, as the regulation have changed, they, they've taken up more, a higher percentage of the ownership of the mine. So there's a, there is a percentage that's owned by local people, which will remain because they want them to be involved. Uh, but there is, I believe, no more percentage being held by the government. And that's, that's, those are changes that happen to the share register, but they haven't had to issue shares to, um, to basically fulfill the cost of any of the CapEx so far. I haven't looked in detail at why it was CapEx negative in the last couple of years. So I'd have to look at the results for that. And what is the all-in cost of production and how much is the resource in years at, light, at likely future production? Well, from memory, the all-in cost, obviously it varies over time, but it's somewhere around uh, between $900 and $1,000. And obviously when the gold price is $1,600, there's a big gap between the cost and when it's $1,200, there's a smaller gap. But that all-in cost should decrease when they open up the new shaft and start mining lower down because the mine will become a lot more efficient. And what's the second point, sorry? Ooh, I've moved on from that question. <laughs> um, and right. how, how much is the resource in recent... In, sorry, and then how much oh. is the resource in years at likely future production? Good point. I haven't, I haven't got that figure to hand, but I do recall from one of their presentations that... Um, they're talking about um, a decade or more of uh, resources available to them. Great. Thanks very much indeed, Damien. Your time is up. We've got loads more questions, but we've <laughs> run out of time. That's the way it goes. Moving on, we have David, and he is going to talk about Unite. 
Thank you. Yeah, so my stock spam pick is Unite Group, um, which is a property company specialising in purpose-built student accommodation. Um, and its ticker is UTG. Um, it's by far and away the largest in the sector with cir circa 75,000 beds, uh, has a market cap of 3.4 billion and is in the FT250. Um, its shares peaked at £13.38 um, in February 2020, but then was hit by COVID and its shares are now down at 9.63, down 27%. And this, this I think, presents a short-term buying opportunity for Unite. Um, student accommodation has resilience. It's asset-backed and its market is uncorrelated with the general economy. Um, so student accommodation was, in fact, the best performing property asset class through the uh, global economic crisis of, of 2008. And one of Unite's strengths is that 55% of its revenue is assured as its beds are guaranteed to be occupied by agreements that they have with the universities. Um, Unite is a real estate income trust. Um, that gives it exemption from UK corporation tax on the basis that it distributes 90% of its income to its shareholders by way of dividends, which of course is a, an attractive um, source of income. Um, COVID hit Unite's business. Um, they released uh, students from their contracts very early on. Um, they've also given them rental free periods and, and discounts. So their income was, has been hit in 2020, uh, and as a result, so have their property values. Um, but one thing we've learned from COVID is that demand for university courses is as high as ever, um, and that um, uh, students don't particularly like online learning. They really want the full fat uh, university experience and are dying to get back there. So I'm expecting a bounce back once the COVID restrictions are um, removed. Um, the market background is also supportive. The demographics are positive. The number of 17 and 18 year olds is increasing and also a higher proportion of that cohort are opting to go to university. Um, the government has also changed its stance and is now supportive. Um, they've changed the rules to allow students, uh, foreign students, to stay on for two years after the completion of their course uh, to work. And that's highly attractive and puts us on a basis with Australia and Canada and other places they might wish to go to. Um, so uh, income seems to be pretty much assured. Um, they also have a development pipeline of about 5,000 plus properties to be delivered by 2024. So um, Unite has income and uh, growth potential, and I think the shares will bounce back now with the relieving of COVID. And therefore, I think the current share price is a good opportunity to get on board. Thank you. Thank you, David. So what makes UTG superior to Empiric? Um, I think, OK, one, one factor I certainly haven't mentioned um, uh, Unite has two off-balance sheet sources of capital. They manage two property funds of student property. Um, and what they do is they develop their property, and when it's mature, they sell it into these property funds, recycling the capital. So their, their, um, their, their debt or their balance sheet is not stretched. They've got about 35% um, debt to equity, and um, the uh, that that is a particular strength which is not shared by uh, Empiric or Diggs CPG. And so basically the market as well, so you know that gives them an, an advantage. And do these student accommodation names have a structural problem in that students may more and more study from home rather than pay high rental fees to live on campus? Yeah, I mean, that was always a, a potential risk. I think this is what COVID has actually brought out. Um, you know, the, the students have been forced to to have online learning. And uh, there was a survey released this morning by Unite where they, they surveyed 2,000 students. And basically, they're desperate to get back into onto, onto campus. You know, the the the, um, the student experience in the UK has, has become a rite of passage. You know, it's culturally entrenched, I think. And uh, whilst online learning has certainly allowed for teaching to continue over the COVID period. You know, it, it, it lacks a lot of the experience that students are seeking. And therefore, it, it, you know, it, it looks like demand will certainly bounce back once, once these restrictions are lifted. And how much of its revenues are from foreign students? Isn't there still a year lag in these playing through? 
Well, there's still there's still some students there, you know, foreign students. Those that were in sort of year two and year three uh, tended to stay in the UK. So, you know, they haven't all disappeared um, abroad. Um, and I, I think it's about nine percent, something like that, of their of their total student base. Unlike um, unlike Empiric, uh, which is far more dependent on foreign students, uh, Unite caters to a lot of um, domestic students or, or a greater proportion of domestic students but i think the 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 foreign students will will come back this uh, change in in heart by the government um i think is important the number of students was certainly i think uh, depressed by the fact that they weren't allowing students to stay on to work as unlike canada australia uh, and other destinations that changed in november so I think uh, this this year, you know, the, the attraction of the UK has been restored. And the dividend yield looks only to be about two and a half percent. Why is it so low? Uh, basically because um, it, it, unlike other sort of REITs, it's not just uh, an income play. Um, it's the growth potential as well. And Unite is, is looking to consolidate the marketplace. It took over the number three player in, in 2019. It took the whole of uh, 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 Aston University's uh, campus um, uh, off, off the university a few years preceding that. So it, it's more than just an income play. They're growing, they've got a pipeline of development, and I think they'll do further takeovers. Thank you, David. Time up. We've got loads more questions, but thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, David. Uh, that was excellent. With a, with a son going to university this year, it's important to know about these things. So next up, we have Nick Cotton, who's going to be talking about RWS. Good evening, everyone. I've picked RWS as my choice today. I'm going to tell you that it is a high-quality growth company whose shares have derated due to the acquisition of SDL, and that the shares are starting to re-rate as the integration benefits start to come through. I'll tell you a little bit about the company and the attractive metrics. RWS is one of AIM's largest companies. It's now the world's largest language services company operating in a growing niche in a highly fragmented market. It counts 90 of the world's top 100 brands and all top 10 pharmaceutical companies as customers and has a market cap of over 2.3 billion. Its main competitors are private equity owned, which tells you something about the cash generative nature and attractiveness of the industry. It makes a reasonable return on capital of 15.5%, and that's only low because of the equity base has been increased substantially due to past acquisitions. In November last year, it acquired SDL. The rationale are to combine RWS specialist technical language services and SDL's language technology expertise to improve the customer proposition, especially in the life sciences and technology sectors. So there's a good business case. I think there is an opportunity since the price has fallen back to 20% since the highs last summer since the acquisition was announced. So what could drive the share price? Number one, so far the guidance given to the market is for £15 million savings in SDL. However, management have already alluded to that being saved. RWS typically makes 20% profit margins versus only 9% for SDL, yet they operate in the same markets. With four, £340 million pounds of SDL revenues, the opportunity of increasing the profits from £30 million to over £50 million is very attractive. Expectations for the year to September 21 of 22.2p is a transition year. 26.6p for September 22 equates to over 20% earnings increase. Number two, a second driver, which has improved trading. 2021 should benefit from organic growth over last year when we had total lockdowns. Point three, the potential for multiple expansion when the integration risks of the turnaround reduce and there is a possibility of increased earnings. Free cash flow should exceed 50 million this year and near 100 million next year. Point four, a large SDL institutional holders had to sell down due to restrictions on AIM investments. Now the overhang is clear, the supply of shares should reduce. Finally, I found it a good discipline to follow the winners. Andrew Broad, the founder and chairman, owns 23% of the group, which is currently worth over 500 million. He would not have accepted diluting his holding from over 40% if he thought there was any risk to his life's work in RWS. In summary, I've explained the business, what the rating drivers are, and now I hope to see the share price climb to all to new highs as the evidence feeds through. 
the broker target is around 810p. Thanks. Very good timing, Nick. So question, does such a large SDL acquisition indicate a lack of confidence in the growth outlook for the core business? No, I don't think so, because uh, they've got um, uh, high aspirations. Uh, the, the organic growth in the business as it stands is between 4 to 6%, um, but they've got grow grander ambitions than that and if it takes them into new areas and new geographies and with this it gives them a new platform the hawk platform which has been developed at vast expense by sdl they can link that into rws um so uh, you know very exciting future and it's a very fragmented market the world's best chess player by a distance is now a machine rather than a human grandmaster. Surely artificial intelligence will be better at translation in the medium term rather than RWS's human translators. Well, I suppose you'll have to tell that to the likes of Google and Amazon and Apple and the pharmaceutical companies uh, so that... Uh, uh, you know, expect them to accept a machine translation for their operating procedures and uh, and their, uh, uh, you know, very, very important um, technical translations. Um, the machines just aren't there yet. Um, they are adopting uh, machine translation to help the, trans the professional translators, but it's not, it's certainly not there. At a PE of 26, isn't it rather fully priced? What price quality? <laughs> um, is it a red flag that RWS has a big market cap but is still on AIM? Well, it doesn't seem to have been so far, does it? It's, uh, it's performed rather well over the years. Um, you've got a very uh, successful entrepreneur running it and uh, he's still very much in charge um, top class management team biggest in the industry um, you know very very uh, reputable uh, shareholder base so they don't think so I think you've asked, answered this but the question is why has the market not liked the action uh, the acquisition of SDL I think they thought that they paid too much for it and that uh, 15 million pounds of savings doesn't really justify the acquisition price. But as I've mentioned, you know, the 15 million pounds is that was what was signed off by the accountants. But actually, it's going to be far more than that. Brilliant. And um, you've run out of time and run out of questions. Great. Thanks very much, Nick. Yeah, thank you, Nick. Well, RDWS is one of my favourite holdings. And certainly they've got a great record of uh, integrating acquisitions. So, yeah, I, th I see it you know, going on that manner. So next up, we have John Sladden, who's going to be talking about Braemar shipping. Thanks, Damien. Good evening, everyone. Um, my stock pot was flagged by Roland for the SIF portfolio yesterday. So I'm hoping that this is a case of great minds thinking alike rather than fools of a feather flocking together. But we'll find out shortly. Braemar shipping is an international provider of ship breaking. It has the same chairman as DX Group, and he's tried to complete another successful turnaround here. As can be seen, it's got a really high stock rank, and it's classified as an adventurous super stock. As well as a stock rank, there are two things in particular that I like about this stock. Firstly, I think it's got a really decent chance of beating its forecasts, um, and a full year trading update is actually due on the 9th of March, so we should find out shortly if that occurs or not. Also, it's very cheap versus its competitors. So look, looking at its estimates, its first half, first half performance was strong with an adjusted profit before tax of 6.6 .6 million, being 73% of the estimated full year result. So it only needs to achieve a small profit in the second half just to hit its estimates. Now we all know that shipping rates have been very high recently. We've seen stories of very high rates from China and ship brokers charge their commission as a percentage of the rates. So there is a, that, that provides a good chance of, of them getting lots of revenue in. Also, the current lockdown means that travel and entertainment expenses are unlikely to, to be high, so their costs should be low. So once again, I think there's a good chance that they'll have achieve um, a good level of profits. Um, looking at their main competitor, Clarkson, now, Clarkson has recently reported their full year results. They've got a slightly different year, 
but they also had a strong first year and were expected to not have a great second year, but they've done well in the second year. So overall, I think there's a very good chance that the company ends up beating its estimates. And now looking at just the valuation, Clarkson's on a forward P of 23 times versus Braemar of nine times. They're estimated to grow at similar rates. Um, Braemar has a little bit of debt and, and Clarkson has net cash. But looking at the trailing enterprise value over EBITDA, it's, it's 11x for Clarkson versus less than 6x for Braemar, which just seems too big a disparity for, for companies growing at, at similar rates and in the same field. The other um, thing that I think may be a benefit is Braemar stopped paying a dividend with uh, the worries over COVID, but they're scheduled to start again with full year results. So that could be another catalyst for the shares to re-rate. As previously mentioned, the company has announced that they're going to be doing a trading update on the 9th of March for the year ending end of February. So hopefully we should find out um, soon if, if they do do well or not. Thanks. Thank you, John. Perfect timing. Um, so question, why do you think Braemar will benefit from ship rates when they're most exposed to oil tankers where the rates are poor at the moment and they don't have much container exposure? They are exposed to oil rates, and that's one of the reasons why they did really well in the first half. Um, obviously, we, we all heard about the contango in the oil market, and they did well. But they're, they're also focused to just general shipping overall. One of the key management presentations has been the, the um, uh, Baltic Dry Index. Um, now, that bounced relatively highly in, in January um, fr from where it was in November. Uh, it started to come down a bit since then, but I think they're likely to to have been a beneficiary of that. And are you worried about the high debt? It looks like it's about six times net, next year's net profit, and the Z score is showing a risk of bankruptcy. It, it does have a, a bit of debt. Um, off the top of my head, I, th I think the company's last announcement was 19 million pounds of net debt. Um, however, they, they've also got a holding in a listed Norwegian company um, and they've recently sold down half their holding with uh, the provision with the, the proceeds from that being used to pay down debt so I, I think they do have a bit of room with the debt I don't think it's, it's a struggle for them and hopefully hopefully we'll find out soon if they'll reintroduce dividends which would give an indication whether the board is comfortable with their level of debt and, and being able to pay out cash and do you have any thoughts on return on equity, which is historically low and volatile, and the dev dividend looks very volatile too? I think that's part of the underlying business. Sh shipping is very volatile, as um, we all know. Um, you have to be very good at, at macro forecasting to, to work out what, what's going to happen. Um, I, I guess my view is it's, yeah, I, I, I think it keeps coming back back to, I'm, I'm not so good at forecasting the macro, um, but I, I think if they, they look cheap, and if, if you think that macro could pick up as COVID starts to uh, wane, as, as people are still buying lots of, of things, um, then it's a, a potentially interesting way to play it. Brilliant, John. Uh, we've, we've got loads more questions, but we've run out of time. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you, John. That's very good. There's an investor in DX Group. It's quite interesting to hear there's a connection, so I'll check that out. Coming up now is our very own Paul Scott with Reynolds. Hello, everyone. Scotty here. Right, Reynolds, ticker RNO, 14 and a half pence per share, market cap 33 million. So this is a really tiny one. Listed on AIM, it's got a very high stock rank of 97, as you can see. I've held this one since June 2020. And I bought more of them recently because I think the investment proposition is improving. Um, see my articles on Stockopedia, the small cap value reports, uh, for various reviews of its results and trading updates, including a good update in January. Um, what is it? It's an industrial chains group, manufacturer and distributor internationally with factories in um, America, China, UK and so on. It's actually a world leader and a very long established and respect, respected brand name. It, it's uh, products, these industrial chains are mission critical in all sorts of machinery. 
And I had a catch up with the CEO recently who um, said to me that they can charge up to five times what competitors charge because the Reynolds branded products are just so trusted because they don't break and they're very reliable and so on. So you've got pricing power here. Now, I think the broker forecasts don't look right to me. So I've crunched the numbers myself and I think it should do about 11.3 million profit this year, which I work out is about four pence in earnings per share. So it's on a PE of about three and a half, I reckon. So when those results come through in uh, June or so on, I think you could see this stock re-rate. Um, now, it's been badly run and inefficient in the past, but it's on a sort of long-running eight-year turnaround under the current CEO, who struck me as pretty tenacious. Now, the interesting thing is he's doing another leg of restructuring this year. Now, the company is producing an oper operating margin of about 6 or 7% currently, which isn't bad. Now, he reckons he can get that into the mid-teens. So if he's um, able to do that, you could be looking at a business with 200 million revenues, making 30 million profit a year in, in a couple of years' time. Now, clearly, it wouldn't be still be valued at 33 million if that's the case. I think this share could triple taking a two-year view if the turnaround goes according to plan. Now, the, the elephant in the room is the pension deficit. This is huge relative to the size of the company, and it's why the equity is cheap. So I see that as an opportunity because you've got leveraged upside to the equity from the turnaround. The deficit sucks out £5 million a year in cash, so it's, it's highly significant. But if the business ends up making £30 million a year, then the deficit becomes a manageable problem. Uh, very resilient during COVID. A lot of the revenues are not recurring, but they are repeating because chains have a finite lifespan. 18 seconds left. CEO spent a million pound buying shares in the open market. It's easy to buy stock because there were institutions all seemingly wanted to get out. Dividends are under active uh, consideration. Uh, and I think it'll be a takeover target because 40% of its bail uh, businesses in America. That's it. Brilliant, Paul. Thank you very much. Um, what's liquidity like? Quite good, actually, because, um, as I say, if you look at the, the, the Stockopedia shareholder graph, um, quite a lot of the institutions are all selling. So um, I found that you could usually, it's not one way you have to chase the price up either. You can just, you can buy in the market fairly easily. I accumulated a sort of medium sized portfolio holding over a few weeks, buying sort of 100,000 shares at a clip quite easily. And the debt doesn't put you off. It's rated as distress. Is it worth sticking to in, uh, with the risk of that? Yeah, no, the debt's fine. It's come down a lot. So um, the latest net debt, I think, was about £21 million, which relative to EBITDA is, is not, not stretched at all. So I think uh, it's always worth checking those things, but it's a bit of a lagging indicator, I think. That's, that's fine. And of course, pension schemes are manageable. You know, the, uh, the trustees co cooperate very well with the company. Um, they waived... Um, part of the pension contributions during COVID. Um, so no, the balance sheet's fine, I think. Are you concerned with low return on capital and margin? No, because the margin isn't low. It's about 7 or 8%, the operating margin, which is fine. And it's set to go up to about 15% because they're going to strip out um, a lot of costs this year. I think, from memory, I think they were going to reduce the headcount by about 600 people, which is obviously not nice for the people involved. But they've invested heavily in new uh, machinery over the last few years. So it's a very well-invested company now with the latest machines. So I think you're going to see a, a step change in those metrics is in the pipeline. And that's what I've anticipated, really. So if it has such pricing power, then why has it never generated a decent return on capital employed in its very long history? Good question. I mean, the CEO is very blunt about it. He said it used to be incredibly badly managed. And he gave a lot of examples of how management uh, regarded the product as a commodity product, whereas it isn't. It's a high value added product. So he's pushing through price rises with um, customers uh, more aggressively now. Um, you know, it's been a really badly. Another example he gave was they had a. He, he, he was offered, a, when he joined eight years ago, he was offered a company car. And he said, well, I'm happy to take an existing car. You know, you don't need to get me one special. What have you got available? And he got two sheets of A4 of surplus company cars that were all sitting in a car park, all on leases, costing the company a fortune. And he just couldn't believe that they had 
40, 50 spare company cars sitting around doing nothing. So he's, he's, there have been rich pickings here in terms of uh, cost savings, and there's more still to go for. Uh, the culture of the company, I think, also was a major problem that he's really had to battle with um, over the years. So I, I fully accept that the company's history is pretty poor, but um, there seems to be a convincing turnaround underway. Great. We've got loads more questions, but we've got no more time. But thanks very much indeed, Paul. Thanks, Tamsin. Uh, that was really interesting. Thanks, Paul. Um, there was just some interesting scuttlebutt on Discord. Uh, apparently, one of our audience members is a buyer from Reynold, and they had real trouble actually uh, getting deliveries from them and had to go and buy elsewhere. But, you know, it seems they have a, a premium brand name, so that's definitely a tick in their favour. Now, we have something special. We have a double act of Tamsin and Rebecca who are going to be talking about SDI. So take it away. Good evening. We're here to show you that SDI, scientific digital imaging, can be both sexy and seductive as an investment. So what's the history? SDI listed back in December 2008 on the AIM market at the lowly price of 12 and a half pence. At the current price at, of 164 pence, that's a 13 bagger, which is sexy by any investor's standards. Its market cap has risen to 167 million and has a Stockopedia stock rank of 84. It's on a forward PE of 25.2, a price earnings growth of 0 0.9, and it qualifies for Stockopedia stock screen, the esteemed William O'Neill Canslemest screen. So how's it doing? It's doing fantastically well. FinCap have upgraded its forecasts to adjusted earnings per share for 2021 up 23% at 5.5p and for 2022 plus 48% at 7.1p. The gross margin is up to 64%. The free cash flow yield for 2021 is 5.6% and for 2022, 6.3%. And the return on capital employed is going to be about 18 to 19%. And FinCap have increased their target price to 180 from 130. But what does it do? SDI designs and manufactures scientific and technological products across a wide range of industries, which include the current sexy sector of life sciences. It's made up of 11 companies, and its impressive growth has come through both technological improvements and strategic acquisitions. It's not for nothing that it's increasingly being called a baby judges scientific. And who are the team? SDI's human dynamo of a chief executive is Mike Creedon. He joined SDI in 2010 and was also the CFO and he's persuaded that he couldn't quite run the whole company single-handed. Legend has it that he's so hands-on he's even been known to buy the loo rolls. His passion and knowledge of the company shines through for those of us who've heard him present. The chairman is Ken Ford who joined in the same year as Mike in addition to SDI, he's also currently non-exec chair of Gear for Music and a non-exec director at Primary Bid. So when did we get interested? We've held since 2016 and 2018 onwards, and it's a top 10 position for us both. And what do we think about the valuation? Well, you can't exactly say it's cheap, but it's not expensive with the enterprise value to EBITDA at about 16.6 .6 times. But this could come down since it doesn't include further acquisitions, which SDI target at four to six times enterprise value to EBITDA. But who are the major shareholders? 45% of SDI's shares are held by fund managers, which include Berenberg, Herald Investment, and Octopus. To finish, we'll summarize the bull and bear case. Tamsin, what's the bear case? Well, they are a buy and build, so there's an integration risk, and some companies in the group will have suffered during COVID, and there's little color given on that. The Attic Camera division, which has been doing very well with COVID, could fall, by say 2023 and that
product mix could negatively impact the margins. Foreign exchange as sterling strengthens could be a weakness. And you should be aware that it's raised a couple of times and could do again in order to pay for acquisitions. So what's the bull case, Reb? SDI has a long history of under-promising and over-delivering. Um, other divisions could well pick up post-COVID. And this could make up for any downfall or slowdown from ATIC. We could expect further acquisitions, which should be earning enhancing. It's got a high operating profit, trustworthy management, barriers to entry, and we love the fact that they're forecasting so confidently two years ahead. Thank you. And we have very little time for questions, it would appear. <laughs> And since I'm moderating questions, it's actually quite difficult to uh, to try and look at the questions as well as answer them. Um, so, oh, the time has stopped, someone's observed. Um, I'm not Surprise. sure. What's the, Reb, what's the dividend strategy? This is your one question. <laughs> uh, at the moment, this is a growth company who are growing through acquisitions and improvements so i'm not aware that they currently are planning a steady dividend stream and oh dear we're out of time we've run out of time for questions there are a few but i'm afraid we've run out of time damien back to you <laughs> thank you that was truly fantastic uh, remarkable performance I hard to believe there's no questions, but hey, what can you do? Um, I've, but as it as it happens with SDI, I've got a lot of time for Mike Creedon. He uh, he joined as FD, and he only got parachuted the CEO role by accident, so he's done a, done a great job. Anyway, I'll go away now because you can see Ed Croft is here, and he's going to talk about Cakebox. Yes, I'm pitching Cakebox, which is a highly profitable franchise retailer of celebration cakes. It trades on AIM with the ticker C-Box, a market cap of 88 million with net cash, a stock rank of 72 and a very high quality rank of 97. COVID has interrupted revenue growth, but its franchise pipeline is super strong and this defensive compounding high quality share is undervalued by the market. Cakebox has an impressive history. Its first store opened in 2008 and it's grown to 150 stores by this February. It specializes in making cakes for purchase on demand or ordered online from its shops. So it's competing with supermarkets, cafes, bakeries, but it's differentiated. It creates high margin, personalized, fresh cream cakes. Think things like photo cakes with personalized messages on them that you can collect within one hour. All its cakes are egg free, which expands the market, and it's especially popular amongst Asian communities. There doesn't seem to be a comparable national operator. Um, its business model, it grows through franchise expansion and does not directly own or operate any of its stores. So it makes money mostly from the ongoing sale of ingredients and sponge cake, where it's the sole supplier with a 70% gross margin. Yes, 70% margin on sponge cake. So it's super profitable with Buffett-esque 32% return on capital employed and 20% margins. It's also got a very strong franchise pipeline. It gets something like 80 applications a month because the investment payback period for franchisees who put in 125 grand is 18 months. And actually, as a result, it actually does very, very little marketing. So expense is low there. Its growth was hit by the pandemic in 2020, but the business was amazingly resilient being in this celebration sector. People still buy cakes. It's an affordable luxury. In its interims at September, um, revenue was only down 2% year on year in spite of months of lockdown store closures, driven by online up 81% and like for likes up 12% year on year. In February, it announced that it had opened another 11 stores since September, um, when it actually had said in H1 2020, it had uh, opened six stores. So investment thesis is really, this is a capital light niche franchise business in the resilient celebration sector. Um, it's got great management and franchisee confidence indicated by the rapid store rollout, even during the lockdowns. Sales growth is, I believe, likely to rebound strongly post lockdowns with stores actually uh, projected to grow from current 150 to 250 by the end 2024, um, and also the new store footprint coming uh, online. Um, so I believe it's a buy at 220. Target price, I believe, sh should be more than 550 within three or four years. Yeah, I think you'll see 25% EPS growth over a number of years, um, and profits likely to double over the next few years. And if PE is only on 19 times, um, and you're getting 32% projected growth, compare that to dominoes on 19 times with 2% growth, 
I think the market will wake up to these quality earnings. That's it. Thanks, Ed. Um, can you give the Ed Croft stamp of certification that this is not another patisserie Valerie? Well, I don't believe it is. The, the, the management are very, very... Uh, it's run by a couple of very, very seasoned operators who've got an enormous amount of skin in the game. Um, I, I, cannot, uh, I cannot vouch that there's nothing funny going on, but I think that uh, they, are, they seem to be incredibly dedicated people that have run a lot of franchise stores before. And um, I, I believe the, quality, the earnings look very, very qu- good quality. What can I say? Tremendous. And we've got a verbal question from Robin Thompson. Robin, do you want to go ahead and ask your question? Well, I think I've had it answered there. It looks so like patisserie Valerie, it isn't true. So I suppose we should look at the stock turn for a start to see what that's like, and I can't see it from here. Do you have any um, views on the stock turn, Ed? No, no, I can't say I've looked into it in great detail uh, in terms of the, 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 the inventory turnover. Um, but yes, I mean, I know that they do make most of their money from uh, one of the criticisms. They don't actually de- take any sort of cut of the, um, um, they, you know, they, they actually only generally make the vast majority of their earnings from actually sales in terms of ingredients and uh, sponge cake, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But they don't have uh, any sort of take of uh, individual stores in terms of sort of rental income, etc. And do you know anything about the relationship with franchisees? Um, well, I I know that the franchisees, um, I, I, I presume they're very, very good. I mean, I from my memory of when I actually did a bit more deep research on this, they actually had a, you know, they, they had a very low turn of franchisees and franchisees have this very, very strong payback period. So I think they're very happy. They tend to make, I think, about 85 grand a year if you're an owner of one of these small cake box stores so they get a very rapid payback on the stores and um i think most of the marketing is done actually at the store level unlike with Domino's, which is done at a, on a very central level so um yeah i, I that, that's what i'm aware of and final quick question there's been a, a rise in small cake businesses that people have been supporting in lockdown why would someone buy mm. from cake box instead um well i i I know from someone who works with me who's, uh, you know, in the Asian community and, and the Asian community are, are absolutely adore cake box. So, uh, you know, it's very, very common to see it's common to see in certain sort of city areas where there are large Asian communities, you know, up to three of these on a high street. Um, so they've got a very, very kind of dedicated and loyal following in certain parts of the, uh, the economy. And um, and that's one of the reasons why they're so appreciated. And also, it's just like something unusual that people, um, you know, you can actually take a photo of your of your friend's face and actually get it printed on a cake. And they're the only people that do this. And they have these sort of unusual, quirky things that can be delivered very, very quickly within an hour, which makes them, which is one of the reasons they've got kind of good margin and it's just a real differentiator. So that's one of the reasons why people actually do use them. Tremendous, said We're out of time, well out of time. We do have a few more questions, but no more time. That was great. I mean, I must admit, I've been burned by Petition Valerie, so I, I, I feel a bit shy of uh, cake enterprises, but it's worth the look. So now we have Martin Flitton, who's going to be telling you all about Gear for Music. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, I'd like to beat the drum for Gear for Music, which is the UK's number one player in the online space of selling musical instruments. It's also very active across Europe, alongside other territories around the globe. So it operates in a really vast market. That world market is worth an annual $16 billion. And within the UK, the segment is a billion. So there's plenty for the company to aim for in terms of growth. Now, since COVID, uh, it's seen sales really soar. As the lockdown took off, um, the effect on, on Gear for Music was, an, resulted in a number of upgrades, which in turn has taken the share price sharply northwards. However, the success, in my view, isn't purely as a result of the pandemic. As following a hiccup in 2019, when it had to warn on profits, the company quickly addressed that and identified specific issues, getting itself back on track with a firm focus on improving margins as opposed to concentrating on volume growth. Now, the firming up on that has paid off really well. And in the nine months to December 2020, sales increased by 36%. But importantly, gross profit 
was up by a healthy 55%. Companies now on track to deliver full year 21 pre 2021 pre-tax profits of around 11.4 million on revenue of 154 million, with impressive EBITDA numbers, not less than 16.5 million, and earnings per share somewhere around about 44p. That puts the stock at the current price on a PER 17, which looks great value, particularly as it will have moved from 5.5 million net debt to a net cash position, which strengthens an already decent balance sheet. However, the current conundrum I see for investors is the forward picture. There's 2022 forecasts that have been in place since June, largely assume that the COVID tailwinds will completely drop off and profits will fall back. However, the marketplace it operates in is very fragmented and there are many high street family owned operators that are attempting to compete and that isn't going to be easy going forward. A number of these are likely to disappear or struggle to recapture the business that has migrated to the online services of G4M. There is also likely to be pent up demand in areas serving live events and that area hasn't performed well over the last year. The area of musical instruments was already beginning to follow the pattern set by other retailers in different sectors. So the COVID issue has probably accelerated that migration as opposed to merely being a one off. Growth has not only been in the UK, but extremely strong across Europe, where currently G4M only has around 2% of the market, the main competitors being Thoman and Music Store. Unusually for a vast market, no one player it's hugely dominant, so there is everything to play for in terms of growth for G4M. Thank you, Martin. Um, are you not concerned about online tax in the budget? Uh, yeah, that's, a, that's an issue. Um, but personally, my feeling on the tax issue at the moment is that the Chancellor is, isn't going to do very much. Um, I think that, you know, further down the line, We'll see various changes, and that will include CGT uh, and other areas. So I think a lot of companies could be impacted in various ways. So I think it's a wait and see on that. Uh, but I don't think that we'll be seeing that in this budget. Interesting. And um, it looks to be trading or be very expensive in relation to its book value. Do you have any comments on that? Um, no, that's not something that I've um, I've got with me tonight, so I'll, I'll check out on that. Well, you seem to have stunned the crowds because we have absolutely no questions whatsoever. Um, I mean, if I could just say something else on that, I mean, I think the, the margins is key for this business. I mean, they don't enjoy the, the sort of margins that you see in other, other areas of retail, you know, the likes of Ted Baker and people like that. But importantly, since 2019, they've really got it right. And I think going forward, that's going to continue. And they've got it up to, I think, around about 29.8% now. And I think that's looking to track up to sort of 32%. And their own brands um, enjoy really, really healthy margins. And that has been growing. So we've got another question now. Isn't the business just a website? And won't Amazon crush them in time? Um, no, I would disagree with that. I've done a little bit of research on uh, Amazon in this sector and they don't seem to, to have made much of an impact. Um, and as I said, it, it's, it's very, very fragmented, lots of small players. And when you consider that the second largest operator in Europe only has 3% of the market, um, I think for G4M, there's lots to play for. And um, I think that the, the, you know, if you look at the forecasts, out there for next year um as i mentioned speaking earlier they were released um by by singer back in in june or july of last year and they haven't been upgraded and they were largely based on the assumption that covid would probably be you know tailing off by september um and you know i think that um there's a lot of momentum behind g4m at the moment and should we be worried about director sales um, that's something I, I, I don't worry about um, too much. And I know what you're referring to, the big big sale by Andrew Wass and I think some others. Um, it's not something that I have an issue with. I think that if, if directors are heavily invested and they want to take something out and there's an institution 
or, or two that are willing to take that stock. Um, I mean, it's something that uh, another stock that I held, uh, Frontier Developments, David Braven did it. His wife has done it. And uh, the share prices continued to head northwards and the companies, you know, sort of um, outperformed. And uh, so, yeah, to answer that question, I, you know, I don't, I don't have a big issue with that. Martin, thanks very much indeed. We've, we've got more questions, but we've run out of time. But that was superb. Thank you. I'm a recent convert to Gear for Music now that they've sorted out their margin problems. So, yeah, I'd quite like to see them uh, head higher. So now we have Dio here, who's going to be talking about Halfords. Uh, thank you. Hello. Uh, my name is Dio Hare. There's five things I look for in a share. Uh, a simple story, good cash flow, limited downside, potential to rise 50% in two or three years, and confirmed by the chart pattern. Uh, so I'm talking about Halfords. At 275p, the market value is 550 million. Forecast PE is about nine times. EV is about five times and a yield of just under 3%. The stock rack figures are good, quality 74, value 96, momentum 87, and overall 98, and it's a super stock. So what do they do? Well, Halfords is the UK's leading provider of motoring and cycling products and services. Motoring is about 66% of sales, and services is about 26% of sales. I see Halfords as a portfolio of businesses and opportunities. It's got about 444 retail stores, and with that, it has 20% market share of the motor product uh, area, uh, but this market is in long-term decline. It also has about 20% market share for cycling product, and this is a growth market because of e-bikes and e-scooters. Uh, it has 370 Halfords auto centers and also 91 mobile vans. Uh, so this is servicing uh, cars. It only has a 2% market share, share and they see this as a big opportunity because the market is highly fragmented. Uh, in cycling services, it has about 8% market share. And again, with higher bike ownership and uh, electric mobility sees this as a growth market. Interestingly, it also has a specialist website for high performance cycling, uh, a website called Treads. So looking at the history, for many years, Halford chugged along with about a billion of sales and 80 million of operating profit. Debt was very manageable at about 100 million, capex under depreciation, Earnings per share about 30p, they paid a gradually increasing dividend towards 20p, and also reducing debt from about one and a half times EBITDA down to about 0.8 times over sort of uh, 10, 15 years. And between 2004 and 2019, broadly speaking, the price fluctuated between 260 and 500p. 2019, then operating profit fell from 80 million down to 50. Now debt of 100 million looks high, with EPS falling, the dividend became unsustainable, the share price started falling down to 150p at the early start of last year and reached 50p in the early stages of the pandemic. As I see it, I think there's five reasons why Halfords is in a better situation now than before the pandemic. Firstly, there's a new and highly skilled uh, new management team. Secondly, climate change will drive electrification and with technology also increasing complexity of both cars and cycles, this supports growth in the sales and their services businesses both for motor and for cycles. Then tough economic conditions mean there will be more cars greater than three years old, which also will require more services. And Halfords have had a huge one-off pandemic benefit, moving from debt to a large cash position, which will allow them to consolidate the auto centre market. Cycling has become more popular, uh, which supports cycling services, and post-pandemic they can rationalise their property portfolio. And also it's supported by uh, a very clear head and shoulders bottom chart pattern and a very positive uptrend. Sorry to overrun on time. Superb. What can you say about management? Do you see them dealing with the changing retail environment well? Uh, yeah, so in particular, I like the, the CFO who's ex-John Lewis and Waitrose and before that Hobbs uh, and the CEO. They're both in about 18 months, I think, as ex-Dixons and Kingfisher. And I think everything that you see from them in their presentations and the way they're trying to communicate it's very clear that they realize that Halfords was a dull business, kind of going nowhere, and they are now uh, customer focused. Can you say why you're not worried by the low Z score? Um, yeah, so I think kind of that's driven by the historic sort of levels of debt. And also, I guess they have um, a high level of leases, uh, which is sort of, you know, you're, you're not going to get your car serviced uh, through Amazon. Sort of, they're going to need physical presence. Uh, they have two thirds of their estate expires or has lease breaks in the next five years. 
And with the tough economic conditions, they have a huge opportunity to rationalize their property portfolio. Um, so yeah, not, not worried. And the business historically, like if you go back over 15 years, it generates cash. It has always generated cash and it's paid a big dividend with that cash and still reduced debt. And I just see it very simply that going forward, they have a potential of being a better business than they were over the, the 15 years before the pandemic. So there, the share price should get back up to the levels it was at historically. And as we move out of cities and stop commuting, we don't need bikes as much as we did in the past. And as we move to electric vehicles, we won't need to pay expensive annual car service costs to Halfords and car dealerships, etc. Isn't Halfords stuck in yesterday's economy rather than tomorrow's? Well, I think Halfords see it as the complete opposite. So first of all, cycling is more popular than ever. Those bikes are getting more complex, e-scooters, uh, or sorry, e-bikes and e-scooters, which will require more servicing from experts. On the motor side, which is where kind of they see the big driver, they have 2% uh, market share in servicing markets uh, in, in the car service sector. Uh, that market's very fragmented. Halfords have got ambition and they've got cash and they've got scale to sort of to grow significantly into that. Cars are getting more and more complex, whether it be through electrification, whether it be through technology, which means you can't just go down to your local pop-up, not pop-up, your local garage. It's going to be going to go through more uh, a reputable chain. And so they, they, they see themselves in growth markets. And one final question. There seems to be supply issues in the cycling sector. Won't Halfords be affected as well? And what would be the impact? Well, so over the summer, I think it was impossible to get a cycle, whether it be a kid cycle, or adult cycle, etc. Those supply issues are now pretty much resolved. So Halfords have said that. Uh, Tandem, which I know is another popular uh, stock, sort of has said that sort of those issues have been resolved. So now it's back to normal. The one thing that did happen with the, the cycling boom over the summer, Halfords went from a debt position of 80 million to a net cash position of 80 million over a nine month period. That is just a huge one off benefit for a business at a, a 500 market uh, cap that it was able to pull in well over 100 million of cash flow. Dee, thanks very much indeed. Um, very good. Uh, great presentation. I should say that Dee has been a presenter at many stock slams over the years, uh, and it's great to have him back. Thank you. And now we have Edmund, who's going to talk about Italia Mining. Thank you, Damien. So yes, Italia Mining. So what is it? It is a copper miner, so it's in the mining sector. Market cap, £450 million. Pounds. Share price currently £3.25. So because it deals in copper, you need to think about the global backdrop, which is the bit I like. So there are three points here. Firstly, I believe we are in a multi-year new commodity super cycle to the upside, which is very good for commodities such as copper, tin, nickel, silver, and platinum. You could also add food and oil if you wanted to. Secondly, copper in particular should see strong cyclical and structural growth from renewables and electric vehicle demand. Remember that you need four times as much copper in an electric car versus a petrol engine car. So that's 40 kilos versus 10 kilos. Huge structural growth in demand. China is also massive marginal demand, very big. Infrastructure investment and housing construction also growing well will provide extra demand. And thirdly, copper inventories globally are at their lowest level since 2008, highlighting just how demand is outstripping supply. So that's the backdrop. But what about Atalia specifically? So nine very quick points. Firstly, it is in a stable jurisdiction. Unlike a lot of miners, it's in Spain, which is fairly stable geopolitically, I would argue. You might, you might disagree, but I think in the grand scheme of things, Spain is a fairly safe area. Secondly, the balance sheet is strong. It has nearly 30 million euros of cash already, and that should grow substantially this year, given the free cash flow they're going to throw off. Thirdly, valuation terms is very cheap. It's seven times forecast PE, five times EV to EBIT, 15% free cash flow yield, and it's much chopper, much cheaper sorry, than copper peers, such as Antofagasta, Central Asian miners. Excellent gear into the oil price. So the oil in sustaining cost that they have currently is $2.10 per pound of copper. The current price is $3.82. So they have massive potential to generate huge operating and gross margins. Profitability is already very strong. Profitability is accelerating. We expect to see this year 30% operating margins, 20% expected return on equity, and earnings per share should be over 100% higher 
in 2021 than in 2020. So very strong growth. And I think they could even surprise the upside if copper prices continue to head north, as I hope. Growth, plenty of growth opportunities on top of all of this. There are new areas in Spain, such as the Massa Valverde project, which they can explore to generate more growth. But they already have 19 to 23 years of exploitable reserves already proven. Shareholders, 58% are held of the stock is held by industrial players, such as Trafigura, Yangu, which is a Chinese copper player. There are risks, but not many. I think from new variants in COVID would be one. Objectives, if the copper price goes back to 2011 levels, and it's not far away now, you could see it go to £5.70. It's three twenty-five at the moment, just to give you an idea. And that's it from me. Edmund, thanks very much indeed. Have the historic issues around ownership and the debts to previous owners been resolved? Yes. <laughs> Quite simply, there should be no further issues now. Brilliant. Um, and we have a verbal question from Simon Cooper. Simon, do you want to unmute yourself? Oh, uh, yeah. Any plans for a di dividend uh, or any reason why they haven't been doing dividends? Um, a lot of mine is 10, yeah. Yeah, I, th I think, I mean, again, there's been a lot of investment, but investment is tailing down and free cash flow is expo exploding. As I said, 15% free cash flow yield, already net cash. Um, so I haven't seen statements by the management yet, but I cannot believe that they wouldn't pay dividends on the back of that because um, there should be plenty of money for further investment, for growth and to pay a dividend as well. I mean, if they didn't do that, I would expect them to do share buybacks, frankly. It should be definitely one or the other. Um, why did Rio Tinto give up on the mine that Italia is running? Surely the Rio Tinto guys know what they're doing. Yeah, I mean, that's a fair point, Tamsin. But what I would say is that don't forget Rio Tinto has been through a huge change in the last 10 years. Um, Rio Tinto is very much today based in areas such as Australia. So they have backed away from certain geographies and focused on their strengths. And as a result, they have got rid of a number of projects, which, yeah, it doesn't mean they weren't profitable, but in the scale of Rio Tinto, it's such a massive global giant, and not just in copper, but diversified over so many commodities, that they have to focus on where they, where they saw their biggest strengths. And I think particularly since 2011, let's not forget the commodity prices like industrial metals have been falling quite consistently. So they have to, I think they've had to focus their investments in their most, most uh, promising areas. And I think uh, as a result of that, this is one project that had to go by the wayside. And Stockopedia compares AYTM with Sylvania Platinum and SLP is the clear winner, this person says. Any comments? Yeah, they're completely different animals. I mean, look, don't get me wrong, I love Sylvania Platinum. It's one of my biggest holdings. In fact, by the way, so is Caledonian Mining, so I, I'm 100% in line with Damien too. But um, you're talking about a copper miner versus um, a platinum, and in fact, rhodium, in fact, Sylvania's geared to rhodium. So it's a very, very different market, very, very different drives. I love Sylvania, but it's a completely different story. And by the way, Sylvania does have very specific single stock risk because it does pick up tailings from another company. And, you know, if that source of tailings disappears one day or that agreement changes, they're going to have problems. So um, I love it, but it's a different stock. And do you see any issue with the company's head office being based in Cyprus? <laughs> um, one might argue yes. I would argue that's there for tax reasons to reduce their tax. And again, this is quite a common story. So no, not particularly. Again, I think that's probably been driven by their major shareholders for tax reasons, since, as I said, 58% of the stock is held by the top three shareholders who are all industrial holders. Well, we've run out of time. There are loads more questions. That was superb, Edmund. Um, Damien, I'll hand back to you. Well, I have to say that passed quickly. I hope you enjoy, all enjoyed the presentation this evening. I've certainly learned a great deal about some new companies, and I hope you really have too. So please join me in thanking all the presenters for giving up their time to entertain and inform this evening. Remember, also, that if you want to go back over any of the stock pictures, we will have a video recording available by the weekend. I would also like to thank Tamsin and Tim from PI World for kindly hosting this event and Sam from Stockopedia for helping organise this and other stock slams. A lot of hard work takes place behind the scenes and without their assistance, we wouldn't be here tonight and for that I'm grateful. Still, I'm sure we can get even better putting on a stock slam 
And we'd be very grateful if you could give us feedback on tonight's event. This will help us next time. And I'm pleased to say we have chosen a date for the next event. And that will be Wednesday, April the 7th at the same time. So please put the date in your diary and think about whether you would like to present the frozen cons of a stock. It might seem like a daunting prospect, but every one of the presenters was in the same position once. And finally, I'd like to thank everyone in the audience for logging on this evening and joining the conversation on Discord. There wouldn't be an event without you. And if you'd like to continue the conversation on Discord or Twitter, that'd be fantastic. Have a very great evening.